you're halfway there, and I just encourage you to keep going. And I, I, I didn't know that, but I hope this message would encourage you to keep going. And, uh, and to see what the end is going to be. The old saints used to sing a song, I believe I'll run on and see what the end's going to be. Second uh, Kings chapter 3, and we'll just pick up the reading and we'll go over the text in verse 14. Great story here. I love the Old Testament. So many great truths of the miracle working power of God for Israel and how it can apply to our lives today in the body of Christ. And Elisha said, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward you nor see you. But now bring me a minstrel. And it came to pass when the minstrel played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. And he said, thus said the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind, neither shall you see rain, yet the valley shall be filled with water. That you may drink both you, your cattle, and your beasts. Notice the text. He says, and this is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord. He didn't say it was a light thing for us. It was a light thing in the sight of the Lord. Oftentimes we look at obstacles that are before us and we see how impossible they are. But oftentimes when we do that, we're not looking through the lens of faith. We're looking through the lens of human inability. When you are facing an insurmountable odd, the worst way to approach that is to limit God to your inabilities. Some people, we always say, I just don't see how this can happen. Uh, there are people who have cancer diagnosis and they say, I don't see how she's going to make it. I don't see how he's going to make it. Well, it's not for you to understand. It's not for you to cure cancer. It's for you to believe God that he will cure cancer. We serve a miracle working God. And we don't limit God to the miracles. We serve God for who he is. But we just so happen to praise him and worship him for what he can do as well. So that I want to encourage you this morning to believe God. Believe God for the, un, uh, for the thing that doesn't look possible. And then it says, and he will deliver the Moabites also into your hand. And you shall smite every fenced city and every choice city and shall fell every good tree and stop all wells of water and mar every good piece of land with stones. Now I want to, you know, just I'm going to give some background on this story because it all will kind of make a little more sense. Because a lot of times when you read a text, you're pulling out of a bigger story. Uh, so I, I like history, and hence I like to read from the Old Testament. If you like history, I would encourage you to keep reading through the Old Testament, man. Read the book of Acts, and you'll find the New Testament history of the church. But this story is so important to Israel it's important to us too because of the application of it and what God did there for Israel and working a miracle because nobody had anything to drink uh, and they went out to battle thirsty left uh, with you know they were in a valley they were in the desert there was hot there was heat they were already thirsty and now God puts them to work I don't know about you but I would have been mad that day I don't know if any of you ever visited Mississippi or the South, Louisiana, Alabama in July, uh, but you don't want to think about digging ditches. <laughs> and worse yet, I, I have the privilege of preaching in Coachella, California. If you've ever been to the southern part, the valley, near Palm Springs area, and you don't want to hear anything about digging ditches in July when it's 120 degrees outside. 
But this is the word of the Lord. And sometimes God speaks to you. And when he speaks to you, it doesn't make sense. But the word of the Lord that day to the people of God in the midst of everything that was going on is what I want to minister to you about this morning uh, for a subject preaching just a few moments. Make this valley full of ditches. Make this valley full of ditches. We'll pray and we'll jump into it. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you and we give you glory for the opportunity to be here this morning. Thank you for this church and the leaders here and the people of God and the spirit of God. Rest upon us, we pray. We pray the spirit of the living God would move upon us and move upon the people as well to help us all in our endeavors to be like Christ. And Lord, help us all in the work of the ministry that you have set before us Lord, empower us as we attempt to preach this text, and we give you all the glory and praise, and we ask it in Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen. We're, we're at a time in our text in Israel's history where now the nation, if you follow through the Old Testament, you will know uh, as you read through the book of Genesis, Genesis is a book uh, theologians have coined as the book of selection. Uh, where God selected a man by the name of Abraham, changes Abram, changed his name to Abraham, and birthed children through him. Uh, one of his sons' name was Isaac, and Isaac had children, uh, Jacob and Esau. You guys know those names, twins. Well, Jacob's name was later changed to Israel, in Genesis chapter 32. Well, through Israel would be born children that would now make up the nation that we now know as Israel. Well, God chose this nation for a distinct purpose, and that was to bring forth the written word that we read now and the living word. What is the living word? Who is the living word? The Lord Jesus Christ, John 1 and 1 says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. 1 John 5 and 7 tells us that he is the word of God. So they were chosen by God. They were selected by God. But when God chose them, he gave them specific commandments. They were very clear. There was no ambiguity. There, was, there shouldn't have been any confusion. There shouldn't have been any doubt. And so as you read through Genesis and you read through Exodus, get to Exodus, God shows them, hey, this is how I'm going to use you. This is what I'm going to do. He shows them redemption through the blood shed of the lamb or the, la the blood that was shed uh, through the doorposts and the lentils. You all know the story on the great Passover. So it was through the blood that they were redeemed. And then by the time you get to the book of Leviticus, the same thing. He says, I'm going to teach you how to war. I'm going to teach you how to worship. Well, how are we going to worship? Through the blood. Yeah. You get to the book of Numbers. Hey, I'm going to teach you how to fight. I'm going to teach you how to go out in the battle. Well, how am I going to do that? Yeah. Through the blood. Yeah. You get to the book of Deuteronomy. He shows them a great deliverer. He gives them the law again and reemphasizes the law. And he says, well, how are we going to do all of this? He says, there's a great lawgiver coming and he's going to bring you out and to bring you into the promised land. How is this going to happen? Through the blood. Yeah. Over and over and over again. And then you get to the book of Ruth. Joshua judges Ruth. Well, what is he showing us again? He's showing us through the blood, the kinsman redeemer. First, second Samuel, the blood. First, second Kings, the blood. Chronicles, the blood. Over and over and over and over and over. God keeps showing Israel types and shadows of a man who would come through their lineage. Hence, the great fight against Israel to stop the bloodline because Satan wanted to stop the Redeemer from coming. And as you follow through the canon of scripture and get to the book of Matthew, we finally come to the fruition of the person of Christ through Mary, through Joseph. And that's how kind of you just read through the Bible. You start to see this and see that God always had a plan. Peter wrote to the audience that he wrote to and says that Christ was as a lamb slain when? Before the foundation of the world. In other words, when Genesis chapter 3, uh, the, the story in Genesis chapter 3, and this is just background, so bear with me. Uh, Genesis chapter 3 shows us the fall of man original sin that enters into humanity. When Adam sinned in the garden, God didn't panic. 
Come on, y'all. God didn't jump off his throne and say, I don't know what I'm going to do. Remember, he already had a plan. He knew that he would create man. He knew that man would fail. He already had a plan. So God didn't panic. When Adam sinned, his plan came into fruition. The plan of God that is God. I mean, who could come up? Hollywood can't come up with a plan like this. The greatest minds in the world at Harvard or Ivy League school, they couldn't come up with a plan like this. And when man fails, I'm going to become man and I'm going to not be executed, but I'm going to lay my life down so that humanity can come back into relationship with me. I mean, that's a beautiful plan. And that was the plan of God. To bring forth the Redeemer, the Messiah, through the lineage of Israel. And so as you read through, uh, get to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 28, the Bible teaches concerning the warnings that God gave Israel. And he warned them to follow him. He warned them to keep his commandments. He warned them uh, what would happen if they did. And then he told them what would happen if they don't. A lot of times we look at Deuteronomy chapter 28 and we, we talk about I'm the head and not the tail. I'm the lender and not the borrower, and that's good, but there are only 14 verses there of blessings. When you read the last 54 verses, it's a warning to the people of God of what would become of them if they didn't follow the plan of God. Why are you telling me all of this? Because when we get to this text in 2 Kings chapter 3, we find out that they were not following God. And the nation that was so mighty had become two different nations. They divided. And now they had become the northern kingdom, which was called Israel, and the southern kingdom, which was called Judah. It was never God's will that the nation of Israel split. But, you know, when man gets his hand in things, we can mess up something. The nation is divided. And in the northern kingdom, and this is just history bringing us to the text, the northern kingdom of Israel had several dynasties of kings. And not one of those kings was godly. Not one of those kings followed the Lord. There was a young man by the name of Jeroboam. The Bible calls him the son of Nebat. Imagine having a neighbor named Nebat. Don't name your child Nebat, please. Jeroboam left the way of God. It was after the reign of Solomon. You know, Solomon had fallen off and married strange women, and he took the nation into idolatry. And after his death, the nation split under Solomon's son, Rehoboam, and Jeroboam took the northern kingdom. And Jeroboam took them into idolatry. They began to worship the golden calf. And God was very displeased with this. This is why this text is your one reason. And so now you have all of these dynasties of kings comes down to a man named Omri, up into a man named Ahab. And everybody's heard that name Ahab. Bible says he's the most wicked king that had ever sat on the throne. And if that wasn't wicked enough, he married a woman named Jezebel. And Jezebel, I told you Friday night who Jezebel was. Jezebel is makeup and red lipstick, and I'm just kidding. Sister's getting uncomfortable in here. That was the traditional way it was taught in the Holiness Church, that Jezebel was women wearing makeup. Come on, sisters. There's so many spirits of Jezebel in here. I'm not preaching on Jezebel, but Jezebel, I'll just say this is a seductive, manipulative spirit that operates in the church that lures the people of God away from the simplicity of Christ and what Christ has already done, thinking that we can bring about righteousness through our own efforts and through our own schemes and plots. That's the spirit of Jezebel. It's seductive. Hence the makeup and all of this, what you saw in the actual woman. And listen, it namely operates in leadership. Oh, we like to blame the pew, but that spirit of Jezebel comes forth in a lot of the doctrine. I'm not preaching on that. Let me get to the text. I'm chasing rabbits. Let me go. <laughs> That's not how we were taught to preach, you know. <laughs> but A 
Ahab had a son, and here's the text, and his name here is Jer Jehoram. And Jehoram, I mean, you think about having parents like Ahab and Jezebel. This boy didn't have a chance, almost. <laughs> He leads the people of God into idolatry. God is displeased with them. And when his father died, Ahab, the people of Moab during the reign of his father were paying tribute to the king. Well, when Ahab died, they rebelled and stopped paying tribute and Moab uh, was going into battle against Israel. So Jer Jehoram comes with this idea, you know, I'm going to go talk to Jehoshaphat. Who is Jehoshaphat? He is the king of the southern kingdom called Judah. Hence, now I'm going to teach on a couple of things here that are very important. It was never God's will for him, Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, to go into battle. You have to be careful with unholy alliances. Yes. You got to stay with me right here. Be careful who you get connected to. God's not going to bless all of your connections. Who you're connected to matters to your divine purpose, your destiny, and what God has called you to do. You cannot cohabitate with the world. You can't listen. I know he's cute and she's fine and all of that. But if they don't know God, you cannot get connected to that person because it will lead you away from the truth. You got to be careful, saints of God. Can I talk to you for just a moment? As a church, you got to be careful what you get involved in. As a church, as a body, we've got to be careful who we get connected to. I'm not here to preach against denominations, but you got to be careful what organization you are connected to. Because not everybody is called of God or anointed. They may be saying the name of Jesus, but if they are not sent by God, it won't lead you to the place you need to go. You got to be careful. As pastors, we get offered things all the time. You know, I get people to call me all the time. Hey, we've got this cause. We want you to speak or we want you to get involved with this because of this or that. The first thing I want to know is how does this cause align with scripture? If it doesn't align with scripture, I'm not getting involved with it. Well, but we got, I had people to call, well, you got to get involved with this because you're a black pastor and you know, we want this alliance of black pastors to do this. If it doesn't line up with scripture, I don't care what color they are. I have one assignment and that is to stand for the word of God. I believe in the cause. Don't get me wrong. I believe in a cause. I'm concerned of, I'm going to fight for rights. I'm going to fight for justice. I believe in equal opportunity, all of those things. But when you leave the scripture, you got to leave me behind. Because God is a God of justice. God is a God of order. God is a God who loves people. But you have to be careful with the alliance. Jehoshaphat didn't pray until after he made the decision. And that's what we all do. Don't get deep on me now. You know how we do. We find something. It's a great idea. We get in it. And as soon as something goes wrong, we say, let me pray about this. Well, you six weeks in now. <laughs> happens to me too. I'm not here to throw, you know, but Jehoshaphat didn't pray. He said, sure, man, let's go out in the battle. Like your people and my people. He said, we're yours. And man, we're just ready to go. And they join ranks with the king of Eden and they're going into battle. And now they get to the place and they find out they don't have water. These people are hot. They're thirsty. And they, they have nothing to drink. And out of all people, Jehoram says, you know what? God brought us out here to kill us. Now, sir, you don't even serve God. You're, you're, his God was literally idols, but he blames the God of the Bible for their predicament. Now, whose fault? was well, it was his fault. So thank God for somebody like Jehoshaphat. You better thank God for somebody in your life who knows God. 
Because when you were acting a fool, they started praying for you. I don't know about you, but I thank God somebody prayed for me when I was playing the fool. But Jehoshaphat said, is there not a man of God here? A prophet of God who knows how to get in touch with heaven. And they said, well, we know one. We know one young man, but I don't know if you want to hear him. His name is Elisha. And I love the boldness of Elisha. And it was like, who is Elisha? Well, he poured water on the hands of Elijah. He's the son of Shaphat. I mean, he's a powerful man of God. Elisha comes in and he sees Jehoshaphat and he sees Jehoram. He looks at Jehoram and says, you know what? I don't even have any respect for you. He said, if it were not for Jehoshaphat, I wouldn't even be standing here talking to you right now. Man, what an indictment. And so he gives them this. He said, bring me a minstrel. Man, I love that part. The Bible says that the minstrel comes in and begins to play. And when the minstrel begins to play, the Bible says that the spirit of the Lord began to move. The hand of God came upon Elisha and he began to prophesy. It's something about spirit-filled, spirit-led worship. I didn't say talent. I said the anointing, the spirit of God flowing through men, broken men and women, broken individuals who have the presence of God moving upon them. I don't know about you, but there are several times in the word of God where you see the people. David's song and it and it encouraged Saul the demon spirits that were tormenting him they left him we read the book of Psalms we've got a whole book the longest book in the Bible that's filled with music filled with praise about who God is man I love music that is anointed by God every time you see great battles in the Old Testament it is accompanied by a song when God brought the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondages, they walked across the Red Sea. The first thing they did was not take up an offering, not do it. They picked up a tambourine and they started playing and they started singing. It's time for you to sing your song again, girl. It's time for you to sing your song again, young man. Don't let the devil steal your song. You used to get in the shower singing. You got out of the shower singing. You washed the dishes singing. You drove down, but you went through a trial and you lost your song. God wants you to get your song back. Hallelujah. Read Psalms and they sang about the goodness of God. Hallelujah. Lift up your heads, O ye people. He says, then the king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, mighty in battle. That's what David wrote down because God moved up on him to sing a song. The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? He is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? The Bible says the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He kept writing songs because every time that the devil tried to kill him. He wrote a song about it. Oh, Saul tried to kill me, but God brought me out. Saul tried to kill me, but make a joyful noise unto the Lord and shout to God with a voice of triumph. Sing your song. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. We can't stop singing. And there are whole organizations where I'm from. I don't know how big the presence is. There's an organization called the Church of Christ, and, and don't get me wrong, because not all are the same, so I don't know how all of them work, but the one I'm talking about specifically, they think it's a sin to have music in the church. <laughs> Forgive me, that's one of the dumbest things I've ever heard in my life, man. I have no idea where that even came from. They have walked we were having when I was a youth pastor they would come into our church and our youth service and disrupt our services and tell us we were wrong and you know and all of this this music in here and you know and it was a funny thing my pastor made a statement my pastor at the time he said you guys will condemn music and jump in your car and ride down the road and listen to the radio we we need music saints God had a praise team. 
God had a praise team. If you don't believe that, go back and read the Old Testament. God set up a praise team. Matter of fact, one time Israel was going into battle, and, and the Bible says that they were surrounded by the enemy. They came in. Matter of fact, it was the Moabites. Ironically enough, same people we're talking about today. And the, the, the enemy had surrounded them, and there was a young man named Jehaziel. The Bible says the spirit of God came upon him in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And the Bible says that he began to prophesy and say, listen, tomorrow go out and face them, but you won't need to fight in this battle, but just set yourself and stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And so he says, God's going to work for you. He's going to fight for you. And so everybody's excited and say, all right, what weapons are we going to use? What's our military strategy? And God says, oh, you won't need a weapon. I just need you to set up your praise team. They're singing while the enemy was trying to kill them. And the Bible says when they began to sing, God set up ambushments against the enemy. They were so confused, they started killing each other. Saints, I'm telling I didn't come to preach on music, but you got to keep singing. Keep singing. Don't lose your song. Paul told us to sing. You walk around, you ought to be singing. That doesn't mean you got to sing out loud. You don't even have to have a, a voice to sing. You may not be the praise and worship leader. But that God never told you you couldn't sing, though. We can't handle it here. It's okay. But keep singing. Amen. Sing in your car. Amen. Man, it's something about melody. It's something I, I went through a... a, a, a a, a very intense spiritual attack where God spoke to me in the middle of it. I mean, it was a, a, a terrible demonic. I knew it was demonic. And when you get attacked demonically, sometimes it's not a bill. It's not this. It's not that. Sometimes the enemy will just come against your mind. And, and attempt to destroy you and give you a defeatist mindset and attitude. God spoke to me. I was sitting in the car. And I, I was scrolling on social media just trying to get my mind off of it. And God literally told me, get off. So you don't, that don't, that's not going to help you right now. Go in the house. I went in the house. I'm just crying. And I'm, I'm see, you know, so, sometimes you try, you try to be so tough. Sometimes men of God, you got to cry at home. You can't cry at church. Sometimes you can't cry at work. But you, when you go home, that's when you shed your tears and you, you just kind of lose yourself. God says, listen, put on some music. This is what the Holy Spirit led me to do. So don't tell me, oh, no, that's legalism. You put your faith. No, my faith is in Christ and what he did. But because of that, the Holy Spirit can give you instruction in a season or a moment of your life. We got to have practical advice, saints. Practical Christian living. I turned on the music and I just start praying in the Holy Ghost. Listen, that thing lifted off of me. I was weeping and, and, and depressed and went to weeping and shouting because when the Holy Ghost moves in the realm of music, it'll bring encouragement to the people of God. Keep singing. It doesn't matter if you got one singer. Have worship service. Pick that guitar, man, and keep on singing. Keep on singing. Call on me, and I will answer. Man, that song stirred my heart. Keep on singing your song. And when the devil comes in like a flood, you just stand there and keep on singing. And let the devil know you can't have our joy. You can't have our peace. You can't have my song. You can't have my praise. Y'all, let me. Let, that was my introduction. Let me get to it. Man, this is the last service. I'm going to keep y'all a little while. Y'all don't have prayer tonight. <laughs> I'll take a little liberty. <laughs> now we don't have to <laughs> right, amen. <laughs> Listen. He tells him, he says, bring me a minstrel. But Elisha wasn't just looking for a talented person, he was looking for an anointed minstrel. Someone who was broken before the Lord. They came in and they began to sing, and the Bible says that the spirit of God moved upon him and he looks at them and he gives them the instructions of the Lord. He says, this is what the Lord has told me to tell you. 
I love this. He says, thus says the Lord. First of all, let's stop right there. It's a lot of words going out. But if it is not thus said the Lord, it won't benefit the church. If it's just a good idea, it may be a good idea, but it has to be a God idea Amen. for it to help us. A lot of people have good ideas uh, in church a lot of times in ministry. I don't, I don't, I'm not here to step on toes, but I am here to preach. Amen. And I'm leaving tomorrow, so what, let the chips fall where they may. I, I mean, but you, you think about this sometimes, and I'm not trying to be harsh, but sometimes people have good ideas. They say, oh, you know what, Pastor, we need to do this. And it may be a good idea, but you always have to remember, just because the church down the street is doing it, it doesn't mean God has it for this local body. Sometimes you got to know that you got to be sensitive to the spirit. It may have worked for them because that was the way God chose to move for them. But now you do it, but the anointing is not there. Now you're frustrated and say, well, why didn't we grow? Why didn't this happen? Because God didn't tell you to do it. Sister Susie told you to do it. And you thought it was a good idea and you never prayed about it until after the fact. And now Jehoshaphat almost loses his life. Because he didn't pray. Thus says the Lord. It's a tough position being a pastor. Because you are, you have to pray through a lot of things. And you have to make some tough decisions that you know when you make that decision, everybody's not going to be okay with it. It's hard being a leader because leader is not about the glitz and the glamour and the show. It's about the service. You serving the Lord. You serving the people. And when you go into ministry, you're giving yourself to the work. And it's not going to be easy. And sometimes you make some tough calls. Imagine the church of Corinth when Paul writes to them and says, hey, that young man that's in there living openly in sin, I suggest you disfellowship him. That couldn't have been an easy decision. To have to disfellowship somebody from the church, half of the church disagreed with it. And then the young man repented. And guess what? Half of the church didn't want him back. I mean, you kind of you, help us out here. You, you want him to repent, then he repents, and you say, yeah, but you're not welcome back. And so Paul has to write another letter and say, hey, y'all, let him back in. And it's just a tough thing sometimes, and that's why it's so important as leaders, we fall on the side of what the Lord says and not on the expectations of people. Because there's a lot of things we want and we desire. There are things my kids want and desire. I got a 19-year-old daughter. This girl thinks money grows on trees. If you got a daughter, you know what I'm talking about. She goes to Sheen, and you better act like you know what I'm talking about. And she fills that cart up, and then she texts me, Hey, Dad, my cart needs to be empty. Amazon cart full. <laughs> She's desired. She needs it. She needs it. Baby, you just bought earrings. You just bought this. You just bought that. Yeah, but these are cute too. But sometimes you got to make the tough call and say, no, I can't do that. As a parent, sometimes you got to make the tough call. You can't just sit back and say, oh, no, just do what you want to do. You raise and create a monster, somebody who's rotten, and then the moment you tell them no, they throw a fit and they kick over everything in the house. Yeah. Now you got to call 911 because you got an injured child. Some of y'all didn't get that, but call, talk to me after church. <laughs> Ask me after church. Yeah, he laying over here on the floor, unconscious. <laughs> yeah, come get it. <laughs> Thus said the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. Now, see, here's the struggle. It's hot. 
They don't have any water. And Elisha tells them, okay, this is what God told me. You came to talk to me. Do you really want the word of God? He says, all right, make the valley full of ditches. Elisha, let's get something straight, man. We're hot. We're tired. We've been walking for seven days. Our cattle is about to die. Everybody's thirsty. What are you telling us to do? Go dig ditches. See, here's the problem. We want some extravagant word from God. Sometimes God will speak to you in the midst of your hardest situation and says, just wait. Uh, you got to tell me more than that. Sometimes God will say, just wait on me. Don't fight. Be still. Be quiet. And you grow hungry and frustrated like a child and we start throwing a tantrum. And you know what? I'm just not even going to go to church. I forget them folk, man. I've been going through for four years and ain't nobody called and checked on me yet. I'm just going to leave the ministry. And God loves you so much he'll look beyond your temper tantrum and he'll still deal with you. He'll still love you. Thank God for a loving father that doesn't throw us away when we get messed up. He says, here's the word. He said, go dig some ditches now. I need some people in here this morning who in the ditch digging ministry. I got any folk in here this morning. <laughs> Nobody wants to dig ditches. But here he says, he says, the Lord says, you won't see any wind. Neither shall you see rain. Yet the valley will be filled with water. That you may drink both you and your cattle and your beast. God says, dig the ditches. I'll provide the water. He says, go out and get to work. It's hot. I know, but go pick up that shovel. I'm from the south. We say shovel, dog. I know some of us say shovel and all of that. Just know what I'm saying. Don't get deep in. Go get it and start digging. Now, here is the problem. When you start digging ditches and you're already hot, you know what we do next? We start complaining. This man got us out here digging these ditches. It's hot. We already thirsty. I mean, to have to exert more energy and you already don't have water sounds absurd. But this is what God said. So this is what I must do. So what am I doing when I'm digging ditches? I'm digging ditches because I'm making room for what God is about to provide. So it takes faith for me to get to work without what he promised me, but only the word that he told me to go with. So I don't have the manifestation of the water, but I got a shovel in my hand. I don't have the manifestation. I don't even see my son that I've been praying for to get saved. But God told me to pray for him. So I'm just going to start digging ditches. I know he's not at church right now, but I'm going to start digging ditches. I know my father's an alcoholic, but I'm going to start digging ditches. You told me the prayer means at 5, I'll be there at 430. Because it's time to start digging some ditches in the church. Have I got any people in here who's going to dig some ditches for the Lord. We got a goal of $250,000. I don't know what's coming. I don't know how we're going to raise it, but we need a building. We're going to start digging now. We're going to start making room now. We're going to start witnessing to the lost now. We're going to start telling them, come and come see a man, not a Weber man, but a Jesus man. And come see a man. He can save you from your sin. Make this valley full of ditches. You digging and you tired. See, here's the thing. God says, I'm not digging no ditches. You are. Here's what we do. We sit home. We watch Netflix. We play the video game or we read the paper. I'm going to get everybody after a while, old and the young. I'm coming. <laughs> It's some habit, hobby you got, you go fishing. All right, now we're getting somewhere. 
hunting and all of this stuff, and you're just, your time, that's what we do. And we, you know, while we're there, we give God a little cute prayer. Oh, Father, just move in the service tonight. Oh, Lord, we need a revival. It was just a couple of weeks ago, my, my brother and I were in Coachella, California, preaching, and the Monday we went to Los Angeles. And we had a meeting, an appointment that morning at 11 o'clock to go to this house on Bunnybury Avenue. And I, I don't like to talk about this in the sense of let's go back. Because I think that's what happened. You know, when, when the Azusa Street Revival happened, many people even now pray, Lord, take us back to that moment. That's not, God's not moving on Bunny Bray Avenue right now. Something started there. You don't have to go to Los Angeles to get a move of the Spirit. God will pour out His Spirit right here in Brighton, Michigan. Right in Detroit, Michigan. Right in the surround. He will pour out His Spirit wherever there are hungry hearts. Wherever there are people who are saying, you know what, I'm going to start digging ditches. You can't dual task. What are you talking about? You, this, I can't do this all day and then, you know, be digging ditches. Oh, she got a new boyfriend now. Oh, he's so cute. Oh, look at him. See, you're not focused. Your, your, your attention is somewhere else. What, what God is requiring us to do, to, to dig a ditch, you got to sacrifice. Amen. To make room for something, you got to give up something. And that doesn't mean you cannot have a phone or you can I don't preach that. You can't have social media. But what we can have is discipline. And if the church starts to have discipline, we will give up some things for a season and a time. Listen, you got something you're believing God for. You got to prepare for God to do it. Enough of this sitting back saying, you know, I'm just waiting on God. You know, I'm just resting in what he did at the cross. We got all of this lingo and this verbiage down pat. But when you're resting in what he did at Calvary, you're working. You're not working to be righteous. You're working because you're righteous I'm resting in what he did and because of what he did I'm going to go tell somebody that Jesus saves because of what he did the Holy Ghost is empowering me to get to a prayer meeting saints we got to stop taking off days when it comes to time to come together and pray that is the most vacant moment in the church when it's time to have a prayer meeting he didn't tell me to preach this but I'm going to preach it anyway it's time to stop being lethargic and lazy and say well I'm just tired I don't have time you got time to eat you got time to fish you got time to bake you got time to date you got time to do this but we don't have time to pray but we want God to make time to move it's time for us to dig the ditch and prepare for the water help me it takes faith to dig ditches because you know why you're digging ditches in the heat you're going to have a bunch of sand ballots go read the book of Nehemiah and people like that who going to talk about you? Where are you going tonight, sis? Oh, I'm going to prayer. Again? Yep, I'm digging ditches. What are you doing this weekend? I'm going to church. Why? I'm digging ditches. What are you doing tonight? I'm, I'm just going to be at home relaxing. Why? I'm digging ditches. Why are you digging ditches? Because I got a son that's not saved. Why are you digging ditches? Because I got a daughter that's not saved. Why are you digging ditches? Because our world is messed up. Why are you digging ditches? Our country is messed up. We got a lot of people preaching sermons about America, but nobody's really laboring for America. And you really want to make or, or, or cause something to happen in this country? Read the book of Acts. The church didn't have a meeting at the Supreme Court. They had a prayer meeting at the church. And when they came to the prayer meeting, the Bible says that when they prayed, the house shook. I, 
I'm just trying to tell you what the Bible says. Now you go do with this what you want. But when the church comes back to prayer and calling on the Lord again and being intentional. God spoke to me a couple of years ago and says you need to be more intentional about prayer. Stop going through the motions of prayer just to say you prayed and be more intentional about prayer be more intentional about getting in the presence of God and when you look at the scope of the country and you read the book of Acts the Bible says that they kept praying until the house shook and what did they ask for they didn't ask for fairness they asked for boldness you've heard this story Young man preaching, I think it was in China, missionary. While he was preaching there, he noticed that the people were sitting on the hard floor. They had no air conditioning. Some of them had ridden 13 hours to get to the church. They had to hide underground to have service. They didn't have many Bibles. They, there was like a couple of Bibles. They had to pass the Bible around. And he said he noticed one sister, when he gave them the text of what he was preaching from, she took her Bible and gave it to somebody else. And he asked her, he said, I noticed you gave your Bible away. She said, I memorized all the chapters. And she said to him, we want you to pray. Because you guys in America have so many freedoms and so many liberties. She said, we want you to pray that we can become more like y'all. He looked at the woman. He said, I'm not going to pray that. He said, I'm going to pray that we would become more like you because we got it made in the United States and we won't even take advantage of saints. We can come in here right now and have service and worship Jesus. Foreign countries, a lot of them cannot even do this. At the risk of losing their life, they come together and try to worship God. We have the opportunity to do it, but it inconveniences us if we have to do it. I preached the message while I was there. The Lord spoke to my heart about Elijah entitled The Inconvenient Season. And sometimes God will take you through a lonely place called Cherith to inconvenience you for a while, to prepare you for the rain, to prepare you for the contest on Mount Carmel. And that's what God is doing to us. He will inconvenience us and tell us, go dig the ditch. And when you dig the ditch, here's what I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to close. He says, you won't see the wind. So don't start digging and looking around saying, where the water at? Just prepare. Just get ready. And I'm not trying to get you hyped up by saying, I know that's popular and catchy. Get ready, get ready. That's not what I'm trying to do, but I am trying to tell you, get ready. Amen. Get ready. And in your preparation, what I believe God's not, what, what I believe in my heart God's going to do is not going to happen on a couch watching a Netflix series, a Netflix movie. It's going to happen when people get intentional and on fire for God again and lay in the altars and be intentional about prayer and keep on praying. Well, I prayed Sunday night and nothing happened. Joseph, uh, William J. Seymour prayed for years. Joseph had to wait 13 years. Abraham, 25 years. You telling me you can't wait a little while. Brother Seymour kept meeting. And they, you walk in that house on Bonnie Bray Avenue and there's a plaque on the wall that says April 9th, 1906, and it happened. We see what happened April 9th, 1906, but what people don't realize is what happened in 1900 and 1901, 1902. You got this one-eyed black man from Centerville, Louisiana, who was hungry for God in the heart of Jim Crow and racism. He was put out of his classroom and could not even worship with white people, so he took a chair and sat in the hall. He said, I'm going to come by any means necessary. You don't like the color of my skin? Skin, that's okay I'm gonna keep praying you don't like the pigmentation you don't like my hair texture that's all right I'm gonna keep praying and he kept on praying kept on seeking God and kept on seeking God people insulted him they locked him out of the church he said I'm gonna keep digging ditches they locked him out and changed the locks and he had no money he said I'm gonna keep digging ditches make fun of me I'm gonna keep digging ditches April 9th his friend Edward got fixed 
filled with the Holy Ghost. And then his wife, who had never taken a piano lesson, she got filled with the Holy Ghost and sat down and started playing. And they started singing, the comforter has come. Saints, start digging ditches now. Don't worry about what they say. Don't worry about if they make fun of you. Dig your ditch now and prepare for what God is about to do. It got so powerful that they, man, I, the people would get off of their buses and try to walk by the house on Bunny Bray Avenue. Now, you talk about powerful. They were not going to the prayer meeting. They were going home. When they tried to walk by the house, they would just fall out. Because the power of God was so strong in the house. I feel that. I'm praying that the power of God is so strong in the house. That drunkards will try to drive by and they'll detour into the parking lot. I'm praying that abused women would just come and be healed by the power of God. I pray that abused children would come and be healed by the power of God. Because the power in the house was so strong that it touched the community. Somebody give God praise. Start digging ditches. This is a work. It's a labor. It's not just fun and games. It's a labor. And we got to get to work. We got to be inconvenienced. We got to get out of our comfort zone got so filled with the spirit meeting got so big the porch caved in they had to move over to Azusa Street they say when you walk in that room you saw wheelchairs hanging on the wall people who rolled in but they walked out they said you didn't even know who the leader was because Brother Seymour was not trying to be seen. He was hiding somewhere praying in a milk crate because he didn't care. They didn't care about race the, the, because the blood washed away the color line. They didn't care about black and white the way we are so messed up with it today in our country. They just wanted one thing, and that was the presence of God. They were so hungry for a move of God. They didn't care who was the leader. They didn't care who sang. They didn't care who preached. We've got all of these conveniences now, and I believe God wants to just disrupt our lives and make changes, but we've got to allow him to do it. So from that meeting came all of what we see today. Pentecostal churches all across this country. Amen. People full of the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues and unashamed. I'm not ashamed that I speak in tongues. Amen. I had a guy at work that said, ain't you one of them Pentecostal folks? I said, yep. <laughs> Don't y'all speak in tongues? I said, proudly. Because there's no shame. You shouldn't be ashamed. You know, they called us holy rollers. They called us everything but a child of God. Yep. Let them talk. We dig in ditches. Amen. The very institution that the world needs. Do you remember? Some of you are too young to remember 9-11. Yeah. One of the most horrible events that took place in the country. Yes. People know what to do when tragedy strikes. Amen. The first thing they did was say, we need some preachers in here. We need some church folk in here praying. Every time there's a God, I hate school shootings and all of these tragedies, but every time there's a mass shooting or a school shooting, they call the church. But every time Hollywood puts out a movie or every time some entertainer puts out a song, 
They don't mock Buddha. They don't mock Allah. They mock the church. You got to pay attention to what's real and what's not. If Allah was the way, they would mock Allah. But if Buddha was the way, they would mock him. I feel like Elijah. If Baal is God, then serve him. If Allah is God, then serve him. If Mohammed is God, then serve him. Whoever you think is God, if the republics are God, serve them. If the Democrats are God, serve them. If America is God, serve them. But if Jehovah is God, serve him. Let the God who answers by fire, let him be God. Let him be God. Man, this valley full of ditches. I'm ready to get to work. I'm tired, but I'm digging. I'm thirsty, but I'm digging. They insulted me, but I'm digging. I lost loved ones, but I'm digging. The husband walked away, but I'm digging. The wife walked away, but I'm digging. You got to keep digging in the face of insults, in the face of what you go through. Keep digging ditches. Stand to your feet all over the house of God. Hallelujah. He said, you won't see no wind. Stop looking for the wind. Stop checking the weather report. And believe God. He said, you won't even see the rain. But when you come back here tomorrow, it's going to be some water in these ditches. And then he said, this is but a light thing for me. It's just like when Jesus said, if you got faith, small amount of faith you can speak to the mountain and it'll be removed that's confusing to us because we think we can move mountains that's not what God told us he says you believe I'll move the mountain that's where he wants us to be in the place of faith the face of believing the place of believing God for impossible things it's impossible with man but it's possible with God I believe that wholeheartedly this morning. I believe that wholeheartedly. I want you to have a spirit of prayer right now. I just sense the presence of God. I believe wholeheartedly. Let me say this to you. I sense the spirit of God. I'm going to prophesy to this church. God's going to use you. You are going to grow. But be careful with the anointing be careful with the glory there's great responsibility when God begins to pour out his spirit guard it with everything guard your integrity guard your mannerism guard your heart guard your testimony hear me saints guard every place of your life and God will use you to do great things for him this is not the end for you this revival is not the end for you this meeting this service is not the end for you what God wants to do it won't be by might or power it won't be by human intellect it won't be because you know everybody it won't be because of your connections it won't be because of the people who give it will be because of the mighty outstretched hand of God so when you get to where God is taking you I want to tell you now you won't be able to boast all you will be able to say is look what the Lord has done look what the Lord has done look where the Lord has brought us from keep holding on church don't leave in the shaky time don't leave in the troublesome time but keep digging ditches and keep trusting God for what God has brought you here to do I feel that in my spirit right now drug addicts drunkards people who are broken people who are damaged saved by the power of God saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ because somebody's decided to say yes to the Lord yes to the Lord yes to the Lord if you're here this morning you want to come pray I'm going to encourage people leaders people are a part of this church people in this community would you come right now begin to cry out to God for this community begin to cry out to God for the body of Christ all around the community pray for your church if you're not a member of this church pray for your church pray for wherever you fellowship pray for churches that you're connected with people begin to pray for God's spirit to move I'm gonna ask I hope I'm not disrupting but can y'all sing that song again call on me and I will answer I believe God wants us to seek him I believe God wants us to, to call upon him I believe God wants to call upon him again when the church prays when the church prays communities are shaken when the church prays 
jails are shaking when the church prays homes are shaken up for the power of God marriages are shaken up by the power of God when the church prays youth are ignited before God and catch on fire when the church prays the house will shake will we seek him this morning will we seek him this morning seek him this morning hallelujah come on come on everybody just worship him